This is the Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy precious name. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who came back from the dead, we pray that you'll give victory and save souls in Radio Land today, and we'll give God the praise for the happy privilege of telling the sweetest story ever told in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I want to begin talking to you about the scriptures that tell us plainly where the wicked dead are now and what the wicked dead are doing now, right now. Did you know out of the 258 chapters in the New Testament, hell is mentioned in one form or another, 234 times. Listen, beloved, it's a queer thing to me that some precious people will believe in heaven with all of its splendor. They, they never doubt the streets of gold. Of course, I realize a few of the modernists now deny that heaven will be a place of streets of gold. One fellow said that heaven to him was sitting on the bank fishing. Well, I'll grant you that that's wonderful. I don't get to do much of it. In fact, I haven't been in many a month, many, many months, and even years. When I was a lad on the farm, I loved fishing, and I've always enjoyed fishing. That's wonderful. That's a clean sport. You shouldn't do it on Sunday. Heaven knows you shouldn't, but it's a clean sport, and it's certainly wonderful. But this dear fellow said that all this pearly gate stuff, and all this street of gold stuff. Why, he said, all the heaven you'll ever have will be right here on this earth. And I mean, this dear man was supposed to be a religious leader. And he said, all the hell there'll ever be is right here. Man, when he's dead, he's dead, and that's the end of him. Well, I don't understand. But there are many people who will accept, many people who deny the existence of hell and deny that hell is everlasting. They accept readily and without argument that heaven is a place of paradise and joy and peace and that it will last forever. They do not deny John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. They do not deny everlasting life, but they deny everlasting punishment. Now, I don't see the reason of it. Let's add two and two in the light of heaven, and it makes four. Let's add the same two and two in the light of hell, and it still makes four. Let's be consistent in our interpretation of the Scriptures. Now, if hell is not to be preached and discussed and believed in, and people are not to be warned about it, why in the name of common sense did the Holy Spirit place it in the New Testament 234 times. Now, beloved, what I'm saying is this. The doctrine of hell is taught just as strongly, if not a little more so, than the doctrine of heaven. And if you'll take a red pencil and a blue pencil and start at Matthew 1 and end in Revelation 22 and the last verse, you and mark around, a mark around every verse that has to do with hell Mark around it, and you'll have more red marks than you will blue marks if you'll mark the heaven verses with a blue pencil. Mark hell with a red pencil, mark blue around heaven, and you'll find more red marks in your New Testament than you'll find blue. Now, I wish, heaven knows, I wish that I could just say there is no hell. I wish I could say that. Beloved, I wouldn't push a dog in hell. I'd pull him out if I had the opportunity to push him in, or pull him out, I'd pull him out. I don't want any man to go to hell. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It's the good pleasure of God to save 
And the Bible says it's not God's will that any perish, but that all come to repentance. Now, I'm just going to mention two or three verses. You read them. I'm not going to read them because I don't have time. On the radio, I want you to read them in, at home. Jot these down if you have a pencil. Jeremiah 23 and verse 12, the prophet Jeremiah said that the ways of the wicked are slippery ways of darkness. Slippery ways of darkness. Deuteronomy 32, 35, Deuteronomy 32, 35, referring to the wicked, says, Their foot shall slide in due season. Now that's Deuteronomy 32, 35. Now Isaiah 14 and verse 9, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. Now there are many, many other verses in the Bible that I could read and mention. But just keep in mind Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. On and on we could go, down through the Old Testament as well as the New. But what I want to read to you today is one of the plainest, and the most powerful and one of the most simple sermons on hell that has ever been preached or ever will be preached or can be preached because it was preached by the master of all preachers, the prince of all preachers. You say, who preached it, Brother Green? Moody? Moody was a prince, but he wasn't the prince of all preachers. Who preached it, Brother Green? Spurgeon? No. Martin Luther? No. Who preached it? I read a little article mailed to me the other day. I tell you, I, I've gotten enough. In other words, if they have a waste paper drive in my community, I can certainly furnish them uh, with a lot of waste paper. Amen. I tell you, there's a lot of paper wasted, and there's a lot of uh, time wasted. People sending me books and pamphlets to prove to me that the Bible is all error, and God put it down in riddles, and God didn't mean, when God said hell, God didn't mean hell. When God said fire, God didn't mean fire. When God said torment, God didn't mean torment. Now listen, you need not send me that. I appreciate any constructive criticism. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. One fellow wrote the other day and said Oliver Green thinks he's right and everybody else is wrong, and Oliver Green thinks he understands the Bible. Nobody else knows anything about it. You've never heard me say that. Listen, beloved, I've read this blessed book, and I've discussed it with you verse by verse, line upon line, and we've compared spiritual things with spiritual. I've had no books of doctrine on my desk. Heaven bears me record. God above has witnessed me sit at this desk and deliver these sermons, and God above knows and God uh, has seen that there has been no books of doctrine on my desk, only the Bible, a Schofield Bible, the King James Version. Now then, I say the plainest and the simplest of all sermons ever delivered on hell was not delivered by Spurgeon or Moody or by uh, Billy Sunday or the great evangelist and Bible teachers and missionaries that have died and gone on to their reward. But the greatest sermon, the simplest sermon, the most powerful sermon, and the sermon that is understandable was preached by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If you should be using a red-letter Bible, the Schofield Bible does not print the words of Jesus in red, but it always marks them off. Now, if you're using a Schofield in Mark chapter 9, look at Mark 9, and between verses 41 and 42, you notice that Dr. Schofield has put a note, and he says, Jesus, solemn warning of hell. Now, Dr. Schofield put that there. In other words, he divides the chapter up into paragraphs and tells you what you're going to read and who said it and why it was said and so on. Now, begin with verse 42. If you should be using a red-letter Bible... These words are in red, and that means that Jesus spoke them, and they were written down as he spoke them. You say, Mr. Green, do you mean to tell me 
that Jesus actually spoke these words and Mark wrote them down. That's what I mean to tell you. Amen. That's exactly what I mean to tell you. You say, preacher, you're just narrow. Well, I'm glad I am. I'm on a narrow way. The Bible says narrow is the gate. Narrow is the way. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way. I'm narrow, sure. When it comes to salvation and religion, I'm narrow. I believe the Bible just exactly like God said it. All right. Now then, uh, if you're using a Schofield, it says, Jesus, solemn warning of hell. Now what did he say? Verse 42, Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and were cast into the sea. Now do you believe that? Do you believe that is literal? Do you believe that uh, what Jesus is saying, if anyone offends one of the little ones that believe, that it were better for that one who offended the little one to have a millstone, you believe that's uh you you think that's a spiritual millstone, or do you believe Jesus was talking about a a piece of rock that was used by the grinders to grind the grain? You believe that's literal? You believe it? All right. You believe that Jesus meant it when he said it would have been better if he'd had it put around his neck and he were cast into the sea, or do you think he's talking about a a spiritual sea, a fictitious sea? You believe verse forty two is literal? All right. Now then, verse 43, let's see if we believe that is literal. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life mean than having two hands and go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now I tell you what. Suppose we stop right there, and uh, maybe we'll get further, maybe we won't, but I want us to stop right there just a moment. Now, if thy hand offend thee, Jesus had cut it off, better for thee to enter into life, mean, than having two hands and going to hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where thy worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, I want to point out several things in that one verse. If thy hand offend thee, now what does that mean? That means if you can't use your hands to serve God, if your hands just cannot leave alone the things that are unrighteous and ungodly and the things that are not Christ-like, and if you can't use your hands to serve God, then you'd be better off just to chop one of them off. Just lose it, that's all. And then he goes on to say, it's better to enter into life, L-I-F-E, and Jesus is life. Christ in you, the hope of glory. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Enter life. He is life. He's the light of the world. He's the life of man. He's the life of the soul. All right. So it is better to enter life with one hand than to have two hands and be cast into, listen now, two hands, and go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Never shall be quenched. It didn't say into the fire that cannot be quenched. I heard a dear man read that verse of Scripture not so long ago, and he was trying to prove that the soul burns up, and he said that it will be burned up with unquenchable fire, and it meant by that that the fire couldn't be put out. It made no difference how much water you poured on it. It couldn't be put out, but it doesn't say that. It says the fire never shall be quenched. It doesn't say that it cannot be quenched, but it never shall be quenched. It never shall go out. It never shall be quenched. Now then, somebody said that little word worm has nothing to do with the soul or the spirit are the everlasting part of man. Well, now I tell you this. Listen. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Better to enter life mean than having two hands and going to hell, where the fire never shall be quenched, where there. T-H-E-I-R. Now that personal pronoun refers back to the man or the woman who had two hands and they couldn't use their hands to the glory of God. They'd have been better to chop one of them off there. T-H-E-I-R, that refers back to the persons whose hands are discussed. So, if the worm is not the soul, 
whatever it is, it is a possession of there, where there were. Now, it doesn't mean it was what you call it. You call it a soul, call it a spirit, or call it a body, or call it whatever you want to call it. Just call it. But it doesn't make any difference what you call it. it. It's a possession of them to whom the there refers. Now, you, you can't deny that. Where there worm. Now, whatever the worm is, whatever that denotes. If it doesn't denote the soul, what does it denote? If it, if it does not denote the spirit, whatever it denotes, there worm dieth not. It doesn't die. It's not burned up. It doesn't die. You can't get around it, beloved. There's no need to warp and twist God's Word and spiritualize and symbolize and make a parable out of a plain statement in God's Bible. You, there's no need to do it. I wouldn't do it if I were you. The Bible simply says if a man can't serve God with two hands, he'd be better off without his hands because it would be better to go to heaven not having hands in this life. It would be better to enter heaven than it would to have two hands and go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Never shall be quenched. Now, if God's going to burn up the wicked, then when he gets them all burned up, why doesn't he quench the fire? And you know good and well that if God were going to burn up the wicked, he would quench the fire. But the Bible says where there were... Now, whatever part of the spirit, soul, or body, or the trinity of God, man is made in a trinity, like God is a trinity. Man is not the trinity of God. No, don't misunderstand what I've just said. We are made in the likeness of God in that we are a trinity, soul, spirit, and body. Now, whatever part of man the worm is, it never dies. It never dies. And the fire is not put out, quenched. Now, those are the words of Jesus. Those are not the words of a fanatical religionist. Those are not the words of a fanatical evangelist. Those are not the words of some crackpot. Those are the simple, plain words of the prince of preachers, the master of teachers, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you something right now. If you can't serve God with your hands, you'd be better off without any hands. You certainly would. If you can't serve God with your hands, you'd be better off without them. You'd be better to live through this life without any hands or with one hand than to have two hands and use those hands to serve the devil and then go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm never shall die, and the fire never shall be put out. Heavenly Father, save the soul that's nearest hell now. Dear Jesus, that precious boy or girl, man or woman, young man or young woman, that's listening to this voice now, convict them, convince them, and may they be saved now, ere tomorrow, be everlastingly too late. And they go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. We claim souls through the shed blood, and in Jesus' name, amen.